Welcome to Authors of the Pacific Northwest, where we connect authors with new listeners and provide advice to aspiring authors on the business of writing. I'm your host, Vicki J. Carter. Hi there, podcast listeners. Thank you so much for coming back to the podcast. And again, we have the amazing Susan DeFreitas, a collaborative editor and marketing consultant for Indigo um, Editing, back with us. So Susan, thanks so much for coming back to our third episode with us. Thanks for having me back. So I want to thank you again for spending the time with us. Um, your information in the last two podcasts were was invaluable. I loved it. And I, um, I've already gotten some feedback from listeners about how great it was. So appreciate the time you've taken to talk with us. Um, and today we're going to go on just a little bit of a spin. Um, so listeners, what I asked Susan, what we talked, Susan and I talked about um, is some more advice. But the advice is going to be sp- Spend around the best scenarios. So, Susan, I'm sure you've had a lot of, you've seen a lot of manuscripts and you've worked with a lot of authors. Um, and so, for this segment of the podcast, can we start out with you describing to us the perfect author to work with from an editor standpoint and a marketing consultant standpoint? Okay, well, you know, there's no such thing as just a perfect author. <laughs> um, well, maybe we can aspire to be somewhat close. <laughs> let me say some of my favorite. That's a good idea. Okay. And, and, and this will give us an opportunity to discuss, you know, what are some of these characteristics? Um, even if you, the, the author who aspires to be perfect, do not fit all of the uh, categories. Um, so, yeah, like really, and I, one of the most ideal types of clients for me um, is somebody first who has put in the work with their own book. Mm-hmm. You know, um, they've, they've studied the craft, they've put in their 10,000 hours, they have really worked hard to make this book as good as they can possibly make it before they hand it off to me. And why do, why do I love that? I love it, A, because it's more fun to read. Mm-hmm, exactly. <laughs> but it also means um, that it's more of a challenge for me, which means mm-hmm. that I'm going to be using more of the, the real expertise that I have gained over the years as both an you know, independent book editor and an author um, you know, bringing everything that I can to the table, um, to help them make their book better, as opposed to in a less ideal scenario, somebody has just, uh, you know, they, they got to the end of, uh, their NaNoWriMo 50 K. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they have barely even looked at the document since they hit the end they don't even know what's really in there. Um, So they're kind of, you know, paying me to tell them what uh, somebody else in their life could have told them. Exactly. Any English major in their life, you know, and they're also handing up something that is just riddled with obvious errors and it's very hard to read. Right. So it's, it's hard to keep uh, for an editor it's harder for an editor to keep their attention trained on that type of sloppy manuscript, um, quite frankly, right? Mm-hmm. And there's also a great, beyond feeling like, um, you know, the, the joy of feeling smart as an editor when you solve problems that are actually difficult as opposed to problems that are obvious, um, is that the joy with which your feedback when you solve this problem is greeted by the author, right? Yeah, exactly. They have been beating their head against the wall trying to figure out, you know, how to solve that plot issue or, or that, you know, they, they know that there's some emotional distance there, but they don't know how to solve it or, or an agent told them close, but not quite. And they've just, it broke their heart and they didn't know what, the issue was those are the times when I feel like as an editor, I can, I can put on my little superhero cape, you know, when I stand <laughs> back and really feel like, you know, not only am I doing a, a great job for the client with my very specific expertise, but um, 
I am relieving them of a huge source of stress. I'm helping to solve problems for them. Um, awesome. So, um, I guess a, a, a good example of uh, an ideal editing client. I love it. And I, I like the fact that you wrapped it around to NaNoWriMo because um, you probably don't know this about me, but I just did NaNoWriMo. We just had it a while ago and I did it, had my first draft. And I'm like, this is never going to, nobody's going to see this. This is just <laughs> like, you know, it's like literally you just dump everything out. And I'm working on editing that first draft, but I'm working on it with my writer's group who is absolutely fabulous at mm-hmm. finding things that I would have never thought of. So I'm actually, I feel like I'm writing the story all over again in a whole great perspective, but I'm really t- fine tuning it. So I think that's I very- think I know it's just a wonderful way to discover your story Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it I'm not knocking it in any way because it is such a huge positive force in the world yeah yeah Um, in in getting people to you know explore the story that's been just tugging on their shirt sleeve for years and years and years you know um and many you know there are great books that originally started off from the little sprout of a nano yeah manuscript you know sarah gruen's book uh, water for elephants started that way um yeah i i am just pointing out the person who kind of just you know barfs all of those words <laughs> onto a page and then, and then just wants to hire somebody else to take care of it you know? I just think that's so spendy in one case you know and it also I don't know for me I was even nervous about having um sections of what I wrote as my first true first draft to even go to my writer's group because I respect their their opinion and I'm like oh this is really bad guys this is first draft this is really bad you know and uh, luckily for me they're all writers so they we all understand the first draft is never usually going to be your best draft and I mean there are maybe people out there that can do their first draft perfectly well and they're great at it but I'm not one of them <laughs> so so it's great I great as, yeah. there are people who write perfect first drafts yeah. Yeah. I I have met a few but they are absolutely obsessive revisers who write so slowly um, yeah, and they never show anything to anybody until, <laughs> until, yeah, until they say it's their first draft. Maybe it's not really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. There are people who say it's whose first drafts are really like their tent. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. great. That's fantastic. Now let's talk about the marketing consultant yeah. side of you on that hat. What is some of your favorite clients to work with? And that favorite client type of client to work with in marketing again is somebody who has done the work before they come to me you know Mm -hmm. um that is somebody who has at least done a couple google searches (laughs) 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 and you know to determine what this thing called book marketing is and how it might work some of the basic strategies and given some thought to you know their goals and ambitions and what their budget and um, strengths are, you know, what what their assets are in terms of um, both what they like to do and what their time might be. Oh, that's a good point. Very good point. As it's very difficult to be the first and the person to first bring up these kind of basic realities involved for somebody who comes to me and says, you know, I want to be on Oprah's, I want to be on Oprah's book club or I want to be (laughs) in America, you know, it's this, it's a similar thing when an editing client says, you know, I, I want this to be a New York times bestseller, but like, okay, but that is a very, that's a naive goal. It's not an impossible goal, but you know, if, if somebody comes to me with that type of huge goal and huge ambition, you know, in order for me to take them seriously, I have to see that they actually have some idea of what's involved with that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that they are already building that platform, that they've already reached out to influencers, that they already think they have, you know, some, there's a number of different cards that they're holding that makes it not completely crazy. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. And so my ideal marketing client is an educated client, um, mm-hmm. but it's a realistic client. Um, but it's, you know, there's also this, it's the same thing, uh, the same type of satisfaction as being an editor where I can look at, you know, what they have brainstormed in terms of their marketing and publicity strategies and be able and, and what they've listed as their assets and uh, availability and be able to say, Hey, look, we could connect these dots this way, or, you know, you may not have thought of this, but you're already a seasoned um, public speaker through your professional job. That uh-huh. you have. Um, what would you think about talking to, um, you know, the, the Seroptimus, because this book is, you know, about empowering young women, or what would you think about like, you know, um, pitching uh, talk at writing conferences, because you talk about the creative process, you know, really helping people um, connect some dots um, that they may not have been able to before, you know, pointing out that their market might be, um, you know, broader than they thought, um, pointing out ways that they might reach people that they thought were uh, out of their league. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, basically being able to say, have you thought of this and have it be that aha breakthrough you know, the client has gone from dreading this huge, amorphous, scary task that they've branded with um, what your listeners know is one of my least favorite <laughs> phrases, shameless self-promotion. <laughs> yes. And now we begin to understand that it's really just about talking to people and they mm-hmm. like talking to people. And there are some people who could be important in getting the word out who are already contacts of theirs. So it goes from that sense of dread to feeling excited and empowered and to actually having, um, you know, a calendar, a time frame, yeah. uh, a, a, a sequential list of actions that they're going to take. And I can say from experience, there's nothing more exciting than seeing those sequential list of actions, each of which in and of itself is a gamble. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that is publicity. You're not, it's not advertising. You're not paying anybody to pay attention to your book or to you as an author, but it's so exciting to see each of those little gambles start. Some of them start to pay off and then it starts to snowball. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of the press, some of the coverage, some of the sales start generating their own electricity and their own energy. And it's, I love to be in the room with it. I love to be around it. I love those emails. Um, it's, it's really exciting to be a part of. Oh, I bet it is. <laughs> I bet it is. So the interesting facts that I'm taking away from on that part of it is a, when it comes to the marketing for being a really successful client working with someone, you need to have a clear vision for what you, where you want to go, what you want to do so you can set goals yeah. um, and have a good ability to plan around those goals and just be able to take some risks and listen, get some feedback Um, because you might not have thought about a specific angle, which could be considered marketing. So, so very good. I like it. I like it. So what about the not so sex successful clients? Um, You know, I I know for me, I'm really great at taking feedback on some things and not necessarily for others. That's just me personally. Um, But what about you when you're working? Let's start back with an editor. What has not, What's not so successful that <laughs> you can share with us? <laughs> it's hard to, to just talk about this as generally as I like to, because there is a sp- very specific type of person who fits this category. And I, I you know, I just have to say, I, I'll give some specifics, mm-hmm. but then I'll just say to everybody, don't be that guy. Mm-hmm. It's a guy. Mm-hmm. It, it's a guy who has had a high powered professional career where he's very much used to being an authority and people taking him seriously um, and being very, very good at what he does. Yeah. And all he's, you know, he has retired. He's decided he's going to write a book. Um, it's probably a novel because he's read a lot of fiction. So now he feels like, you know, Having read so many books, of course, he can write one. 
<laughs> this this is the often I have had lovely clients. Let me just give a caveat. Yeah, I've had lovely clients who fit this exact demographic. Sensitive, interesting, you know, gracious, wonderful guys who fit this uh, demographic. But they're uh, of the problem clients I've had, there's a lot of them fit this demographic as well, right? Because they don't know how to take feedback. They've never in their life had somebody really, you know, uh, they, they really had to take uh, criticism to heart. And they're not used to failing. You know, that's the thing about switching from um, maybe a more logic or science based uh, profession to the arts is that you can't just check all the boxes. You can't just go to the conferences and read the right books and nail it on your first try. This is art, you know? (laughs) And so um, the, I guess what I'm pointing out is, is the client who cannot hear critical feedback, you know, when, when they hear the things that aren't working in the feedback, you know, all of a sudden they can't hear any of the positive things that I'm saying about it at all. Right. Cause they're just incensed. And then, you know, this type of problem client then makes it personal. You know, it's, it must be that, you know, me, the editor they hired, didn't know what they were talking about, right? It couldn't possibly be a problem with the work itself. Or, you know, it goes back to, and I've had this with um, other types of clients too, um, who fit uh, totally different demographics, where, you know, because they didn't like what you had to say, they come back with, well, this, this is art, it's completely subjective, that's just your opinion, well, that's absolutely true. But then why did you spend the money to hire an expert? You know, if, yeah. if you really believe that everybody's opinion is of equal value, right? Yeah. Paying for my education, which uh, frankly, I'm still paying for too. <laughs> for, you know, my 10 years, 10 plus years as a, as a professional editor and a book coach, you know? Yeah. All of these things, you know, it's so easy to take it personally but it's so unprofessional, you know? And when I see an author who who responds that way in writing, because of course we're all going to respond that way emotionally in our, the privacy of our own offices to our poor spouses, you know, when we first read it, when like, you know, we're seeing red and the tops of our heads are on fire where you get that editorial letter. Like, of course you all feel it. I feel it too. People, especially when you first start off, right? Newbie writers, because it seems so perfect and magical to you um, until somebody else actually reads it and, and tells you how it, how it's hitting, how it looks to somebody who's other than you, but you don't respond, right? Just give it a day, give it a couple days, go back and read that editorial letter and like, something magical will have happened. <laughs> no, it's so true. And, and you know, all the, the, the feedback that seemed so horrible, you'll go back and read it. You realize it really wasn't that, that critical. It wasn't that bad at all. Yeah. And, the, and the positive stuff that you completely missed, you're going to see was glowing, right? <laughs> you know, there was a lot of good stuff you missed too. So, you know, the, the non-ideal client for me is the one who not only has the most outsized reaction to the critical feedback, but then immediately writes back, you know, telling me why I'm wrong and then attacks me personally because of it, you know, in this very defensive way. Um, So whoever you are, whatever demographic you fit, please don't be that guy. (laughs) I think that's a great example. And it's something that, I mean, I experience often with students because I work with students. Oh, yeah. Um, I work with adult students. Um, we're not, and we're, 
I deal what we call in our industry, and I'm sure you heard this emotional intelligence. You know, there are people that can take feedback and have very good emotional intelligence around feedback and, and, and um, learning a new process because that's really what my adult student, students are doing is they're learning how to be students and learning how to finish their degrees and learning new skills. And sometimes that alone challenges it to the point of where their mentally and emotional intelligence might be down a bit when you give them feedback. And um, so I'm always training. It's a part of my role is to train individuals on how to receive feedback now. I was not always the best with it in my own personal life or professional life either. (laughs) And so it is a growing um, skill we have to learn. And so I think it's very valuable that you pointed out, don't be that person, you know, don't be the one that can't um, receive feedback and shut down or fire off that email right away. Because I'll tell you, I get a lot of emails when students fail immediately, like, instantaneously, probably the first five paragraphs I don't read because I know what it's saying. I know where they're at. And I go down to where they say, sorry, I'm venting, but (laughs) and that's what I address, you know? So yeah. Yeah. Spouse, vent to your cat, vent to (laughs) your spouse, your husband, go to the bar and drink a beer and vent, but don't not to me. (laughs) Yeah. You know, take, take a minute because if you really want to do this, you know, if you're, if you're serious about being an author, I, I am the person, you know, who is most in your ring. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I am the person who frankly cares the most out of all of the people you're going to send it to, whether literary agents, you know, are yeah. <laughs> the editors, your acquisitions editors, you know, they yeah. don't care. Like they, they, they care about their work. They care about quality literature, but they have no investment in, in your particular, uh, you know, manuscript. Whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, if you hire an editor, you know, that editor is stepping into your ring as Mm -hmm. your coach. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the best analogy for it is that anybody who's been in a sport your coach has probably told you things that you did not want to hear, mm-hmm. you know, but your coach wants you to win. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's why they're telling you these things, you know? So um, it, it is never helpful to, to treat uh, your freelance editor, your collaborative editor in an adversarial way. <laughs> I Absolutely not the way that this person is coming to you. Exactly. Yeah. Well, awesome. Let me ask you this. And I'm so glad you threw an analogy in there. So I was waiting for one today because I love the analogies. <laughs> Yay, got one in. Um, so Susan, have you ever been to a point with a client where you're just, I'm going to fire the client. I can't help them. And because I feel like there are times and moments and situations where that is almost healthier for both the author in this scenario and the editor than to keep trying to push through to get them to hear what you're having to say. Absolutely. You know, and uh, I feel like as a younger woman, I would, I was so reluctant to do that. It would have to be like, somebody would have to be making death threats to me or something. (laughs) Not not that far. Oh, I hear it. Yeah. It would have to be so extreme. Yeah. Whereas, you know, again, just having a more, and summer projects the more I see that it does not help anybody to remain in um, a, a professional relationship when you don't speak each other's language and you don't see each other's vision you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really I really do my best to help my clients achieve their vision and their goals mm-hmm. not to impose you know, my own as an editor at all. Um, but there are times when those goals to me do not seem realistic or they seem totally out of keeping with the approach Mm -hmm. the client has chosen and they don't want to hear. They, They don't want that note of realism. They don't, you know, or when I'm saying, I find myself giving the same feedback over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Without the client uh, incorporating it, you know, those are cases, those are signs that um, this client would be a better fit for someone else. Mm-hmm. Because 
maybe someone else would be able to articulate uh, that feedback in a way that seemed more urgent or clear. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, maybe somebody else is going to be able to, you know, articulate to that client, you know, the gap between their approach and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, Mm -hmm. I will do my absolute best, but again, it's different strokes for different folks. So, you know, you really not only should, um, you know, uh, freelance editors, collaborative editors, independent editors, all these folks in, in this protect particular sphere where we're helping people with their manuscripts, you know, helping them to uh, shape their, their voice and their vision. Not only should um, the contractor always feel, you know, um, this space to fire the client, you know, the clients should know that mm-hmm. if they're not feeling it, especially female clients. Mm-hmm. You know, because yeah. Because women are trained to be so nice and we, you know, we don't ever want to, you know, give up on somebody or, you know, be the bad guy. But, but, but you are the client. If, if you're not feeling the, this really good uh, resonance and relationship, working relationship with um, your editor or book coach, you know, it's totally okay to just say, thank you so much for your help. You know, I think I'm, I'm going to work, explore working with someone else on this, you know, and pay the bill. <laughs> oh yeah. Just don't forget. You need to pay the bill. Cause I'm sure your name would get around as somebody that doesn't pay. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, such value advice. Well, I'll tell you what this episode has done for me as long and the other two episodes. So listeners, if you haven't gone back and heard the other two episodes with Susan, make sure you download those and listen to them. But for me, I was a little hesitant about the idea of hiring an editor. I know it's part of the process of being a really good writer, um, but I was a little hesitant. But what you've done for me is you've given me such a great understanding of what an editor will do and a marketing consultant can do for somebody like myself that it makes me feel so much more comfortable and understanding the process that it is like a coaching environment. And and that's how it should be looked at as a relationship and a coaching environment. So thank you for that. It makes me actually kind of excited to be at the step where I'm ready to find that person to help me in that capacity. So I'm so glad it makes you feel excited about it because it's an exciting process. Like really, a really good editor, what they will do for your manuscript, like, there is so much excitement generated in this process on both ends. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. That's why I do what I do. So don't, don't be afraid, you know, find the right person, you know, do the work, do the research and then yeah. Em- embrace the process because it's, it is exciting. Well, I think with that, that's an awesome place to stop this whole three three series. It's been fabulous having you on, Susan. You've been a definite voice of reason and fresh air for me. And I hope our listeners have um, discovered the same excitement that I have about moving towards that process of finding the partner in editing and marketing. Because um, you've given such great tips about marketing. I'm like, this, you've just been very helpful. So thank you. Um, oh, I'm so here. Yeah. So thank you for being on the podcast. And if I come up with any other questions in the future, maybe we'll bring you back on and continue, continue the discussion. I'd be happy to do it. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We hope you enjoyed the episode as much as we did. Follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter where you can be entered automatically each month to win a signed free copy of a book from an author that's appeared on the podcast. You can find out more at our website, www.squishpin.com. And finally, if you're an author in the Pacific Northwest and you would like to appear on the show, you can find out more on our website. So until next week, I hope you enjoy the journey. This is Vicki J. Carter signing off.